right, what's up? How's it going? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Hollywood Tales. My name is Ahmed Ahmed, your host and my co-host. Blake Barty. Check us out here on YouTube. We are on Spotify, Amazon, Podbean, Jam in the Van YouTube channel. Just go to Hollywood Tales Podcast. We just started this podcast at the Jam in the Van studios. If you have not been here, I talk about it every week. You got to come check it out. Go to jamofthevan.com, and you'll see all their upcoming shows. It's a really cool venue. It's a uh, rehab. It's an ex rehab center um, that they've converted into this like live venue that has music and comedy and podcasts now. So it's really fun. Go to jamofthevan.com and uh, check them out. And uh, we have a special guest coming on that I'm yeah. excited to bring on. Hell yeah! Did you check him out at all? Yeah. Or, right. What did you? What did you? Without saying his name, what did you come up with? As far as how prestigious he is. I, I mean, I have <laughs> questions. It's good. All right. Well, well, we'll just bring him right on. Our guest on this episode of Hollywood Tales is an old dear friend of mine. He's a fellow Egyptian American. He, uh, fuck. I think I'm gonna fuck this up. Born in America, raised in Dubai, moved back to America. I'll let him confirm or deny that. He is an accomplished magic magician, <laughs> musician. <laughs> Keep that. Don't don't cut it. He's an accomplished, highly accomplished uh, musician, music composer. He's his his IMDb is a mile long. We met through a mutual friend of ours named Iyad Zahra who directed a, a beautiful film called Taqwa Cores about the punk rock Muslim scene in North America. And Omar uh, was the music composer on this thing. And so I, when I was making my documentary, Just Like Us, I, uh, I reached out to Omar and I said, would you be interested in working with us and collaborating on our documentary? He said, yes, he did an amazing job. If you wanna hear any of the music, just go to iTunes, type in Just Like Us, the movie. 98% of it is his music. A couple licensed things here and there, but most of it is his nice and original. Um, and he's going to sample some for us as well. So without any further ado, please welcome our guest virtually here at Jam of the Van uh, Hollywood Tales podcast, Omar Fadel. Hey. Hey, Omar. What how's up? it going? What's Hello. happening? What's up, Habibi? How are you? <laughs> doing good. How are you guys doing? Good. If bad. if uh, if those people out there who don't know the word Habibi, it means it's a term of endearment. It means like my sweet, my love, but guys could say it to each other. And yeah, it's no, like buddy. It's like buddy in Arabic. Habibi. Yeah. Like yeah, it yeah. In, Habibi. But yet, do you have I, to? Be I really Arabic? feel like uh, at a loss here because I don't have any magic tricks uh, ready to go here. <laughs> but I actually. Th there is a possibility that it would be more interesting interview if I was a magician, but um, you know, I don't know a, why I said that. I think you it's are all right. a, a magician. We've, we've been way. making podcasts all day morning, so I'm just like, oh, magician, magician. Well, I'm a little Close frazzled. Enough. Omar, this is my good friend, comedian co-host Blake Barty. He's never called What's me Habibi Blake? though, so it's okay. I'm gonna start oh, calling you, know. you Habibi. I wish you would. I'm gonna Make start calling you my it. white, my white, <laughs> my white Habibi. Nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you. So, guys, this is Omar Fado. He uh, did I was I correct with the born in U.S. Mm -hmm. raised? I was in born Dubai? in Houston. Born, born in Houston, Houston. Grew up uh, Dubai, Egypt, Oman, uh, a bunch of places. My my dad worked in the oil business, so we moved around every couple of years. So and you, then yeah, finished high school in the U.S. Right. And the Arab people are very good, but since the Kalam Kways, yeah, I'm a Kalam Kways, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to throw out my dirty Arabic to Omar, and he's like, "Yeah, bro, let's keep it American tonight." Are, are we? Are we? Do, are we? Are we keeping it clean? Is this a clean, uh, censored conversation? No. Or are we? No, no. Oh, okay, nope. so we're, we can drop drinking, any drinking Stella, saying "fuck, fuck, 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 fuck," whatever you want. Fuck, 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 fuck. fuck. Okay, <laughs> I know good. that's your favorite word Feels good. too. Feels good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so look, let's get into it. Uh, sure. I want, we we want to talk about. Uh, how we know each other, uh, our work relationship, our friendship. Talk about some of the projects you um, have done and are getting into. And then we'll end it with your best Hollywood tale. But let's start out with how you got started as a musician. You were in a heavy metal band, if I remember correctly, you told me. Yeah, I mean, of, how I got started. A couple of them. 
Yeah, for sure. But then, I mean, how it got started, uh, you know, I started, my grandmother started teaching me piano when I was five or six, I think. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, like up until, um, I guess, high school, I had like teachers on different instruments. I had like piano teacher, drum teacher, uh, guitar teacher, and um, I don't really know why. All at the same time or like at different times? Some of them were kind of going at the same time. Like... I think piano and drums were going at the same time. And then at some point I got tired of the piano lessons. I think I got tired of the instructor actually. I think it's tired <laughs> of piano. Um, and then, you know, over the years, it's kind of um, expanded where I have, uh, my wife would at least say that I have um, too many instruments. So it's how many like, instruments? You know, yeah. I mean, I'm how many seeing, do you I'm, play? I can, yeah, I can see in your background. How many do I play well or how many do I play? Cause there's a big difference. <laughs> how many <laughs> well, do you use when you're, you know, you know, composing something? Oh, I, I I don't even know. I mean, just looking around like this part of the room, there's probably 20 or 30 that are within arm's reach. But, um, you know, I mean, the thing is, like, a lot of them are kind of unique, strange uh, instruments. And, you know, they get used maybe, if I'm lucky, once a year. Um, but, you know, it's like you have that one project that needs some weird uh you know, Sound. obscure instrument. And I'm like, I have that instrument. I haven't played it in two years. It's got a bunch of dust on it. And, it play. <laughs> and then it goes back on the stand and it doesn't get played for a while. So, and by the um, way, you, you play a lot of mm -hmm. unique instruments because you come, you score a lot of not only film and TV, but like, like video games. And didn't you score Assassin's Creed or some shit? Yeah, I was or? on Assassin's uh, a while back. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, it's, can you imagine the sound I don't effects think on that? I played it. It's yeah. beautiful. Whoa, 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 a bunch whoa, of weird, whoa, uh, weird yeah, and, and that particular assassins, it was um, like a lot of kind of plucky, you know, piratey sounding, you know, instruments. So it's like, you know, I, these things they don't get used a lot. <laughs> Essentially, that is uh, the way it is. Actually, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ping lots thousand. of toys, and they all get played at some point in time. So we we had a little not argument or dis. I guess it was more of a discussion about. Okay. Can we talk I about this? I know where this? we're going. You know, where I know where we're going. I, I think I've heard about this as well. <laughs> Omar, Omar Fadil is, and go to his website, Omar Fadil, uh, O-M-A-R-F-A-D-E-L.com. Find him at Omar Fadil uh, Composer, is it, on Instagram? Uh, quite possibly, I think so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the worst person to ask about these things. Anyhow, I think so, though. He's, a, he's one of the most talented musicians I've ever met. Like he just has so much musical range and he can sing too. Uh, you're too kind, man. But I said, I asked him, it's kind of a similar question that you asked. I said, you know, is, is there something you don't play or won't play? And you said, I don't do brass. No, I said, I don't play brass. You, you said it's Which not a real. Mean I don't like it. You said it's we, not an no, instrument. I don't remember that part of the conversation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> It was kind of a snobby, like the way you said. Maybe you didn't say that exactly, but you're kind of like, yeah, I don't fuck with brass. He's a strings guy. You're strings and drums and vocals. This alleged conversation has been <laughs> we'll like following on. me around now for years. Like it's, it's like you don't like brass and you don't like winds. I write for them. I just don't play them. You, know? so you gotta you gotta be realistic with your uh, you know goals and objectives as far as a musician. I just have never been good with those kinds of instruments. So that's like I, saying I, that's other like people saying, playing for them. That's like saying I write jokes for comics, but I won't perform them. You won't play. You won't yeah. play the brass, Omar. I don't know how to do it. It's never been my thing. I've tried. You don't know like how. I tried. Or you just you don't, you don't you don't respect. The I don't instrument. know how. I don't think it's. I know. I respect the instrument. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm fucking with for you. years. You know we've with. had this discussion. I, I, I love, love it. To all my uh, woodwind and, and brass playing friends out there who I've hired on many a project. I have nothing personal against your uh, your instrument of choice. I, I you know, I respect you. <laughs> kind, of, kind of backhanded, but okay. Uh, so, you 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 start out in music. Uh, you, you're you're being trained classically, basically, right? Like you're getting. Yes. And, and by the way, expensive lessons, not like one or two a week. You're playing every instrument like five days a week. It sounds like. Yeah, it was a lot of it. I don't know why, because I don't come from a family of. Um, professional musicians like i have you know a couple well, of you came from a family of oil money so they could afford it <laughs> well <laughs> sorry i'm just throwing it out there bro how many tigers did you own growing up oh my gosh you know <laughs> you know it's, i'll t tell you a funny anecdote is that when i met bethany my wife 
she knew that my dad worked had worked at this point he hadn't been in the oil business for a long time and she, he's like he's a son of an oil man he's like some you know stupid rich person <laughs> um and i you know she's from west texas where that's all oil money so i assumed that she was like the very rich oil person it turned out that neither one of us were and we we kind of both got screwed in that that sounds that like a, that sounds like a bad rom-com she's like my like, dad two, works two at couples, jiffy lube he changes what, oil one couple yeah my dad my dad <laughs> makes oil money that's you met your wife in college right i i had just finished college she was still in college yeah but you went We'd to, been together uh, for i went to ut university UT. of texas at austin right. yeah so what's that like? You're an Marty. Egyptian, you're an Egyptian Muslim American who if you closed your eyes and you were to start speaking, no one would know that you were Egyptian. You sound very very American. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> did mm -hmm. your name and culture and color of your skin affect you while you were going to school in Texas? Cuz Texas is a very, you know, let's just put it out there. You 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 from there? You live there? I'm from there. Well, I've look, been there. You look like you're from there. Yeah. It's a very, you know, <laughs> it's a, sorry. I, I might get canceled after this episode. <laughs> You're fine. Uh, did you, I mean, did, I don't, did you, did you receive any like, you know, backlash or, did, or people are like, oh, this guy's fucking cool. He drinks beer and he plays guitar. Austin's. I mean, nice. I don't remember like any of, of that. I mean, I, I, not to be like heavy, but, or heavier, but I, I would suspect that your, um, um, existence is it runs like a similar uh uh plot or story which is like there's you know as an arab american there's before 9 11 and then there's after 9 11. Mm -hmm. so um, any of that weirdness or you know being like hyper aware of your ethnicity or religion or whatever is all after 9 11 when right. there was you know kind of a schism you know and it was like before and after and before days were totally different and and so that to me is like when um when i remember like distinctly remember like you know being hyper aware of of culture ethnicity all that stuff that's i was wrapped in there i was hyper hyper aware of it too after 9 11 and you know my story i mean being mm -hmm. detained arrested and profiled and all that but in the 70s and 80s we were still feeling it in riverside california um from people that didn't know what an arab was they didn't know what a muslim was right. They would call off our house and say, go back to your fucking country, you Iranians. And we're like, we're Egyptians. It's pure ignorance. No, it's just like, it's geographical ignorance. Yeah, yeah, it's racism and ignorance. So, you know, yeah, I had to educate my haters. Uh, but I guess in Texas, it didn't really matter. You were in a rock band, so I, that probably helped, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you kind of get the cool <laughs> card uh, if you're in a rock band. That's just by default. So, you know, take it where you can get it, I suppose. What instrument is but, your, um, your bread and butter instrument? Now? What what, what are you the best at? Uh, brass, probably brass. piano because I, I see bra brass, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Secretly <laughs> actually. <laughs> I'm a French horn player. <laughs> no, I mean I sit at <laughs> I sit at a at a um, you know, uh, at a keyboard or piano literally all day long. So it's it's you know, just kind of becomes your go to thing. And and that's yeah. I think most composers like, you know, it's kind of goes with the territory, you know? I mean, I think we, you can see a piano in the background. Back. Countless yeah. synthesizers to go through and all those different sounds. So that Countless sense. synthesizers and drum machines and shit everywhere, man. Um, yeah. yeah, lots of stuff. Let me, um, I just, I, I was looking through, Sorry, uh, I was looking for a photo of something earlier. And I, um, I found this photo that I, t I'll send it to you afterwards. I found this photo of, I think it's a picture of your dad. Um, when we were in the, uh, we were recording part of the Just Like Us score. And so there's like a little picture, like I can see the TV with your dad on it. And then below it, there's like, you know, displays and keyboards and shit just lying around the studio. And, and, you know, it's the same thing it is now. It's just, there's more shit now. So did it's, I, um, but it's great. Did I take I'll that picture? I'll send you that photo. You may have, I don't know. I think we were in your studio. So let's, let's fast yeah. forward and I want to go back. You and I met um, through Iyad Zahra, our good friend and brother, right. <clears throat> who made this awesome film called Taqwa Corps about the punk rock Muslim scene in North America. It's based off of a book, then a documentary, then mm -hmm. uh, Iyad made it into a feature, and he won a bunch of awards and Sundance Film Festival Audience Appreciation Award and all that stuff. But he scored, you scored his movie. 
Right. And then when I went to and that's him, how we I, met. Right. And I said, hey, I'm looking for a music composer. And he said, I know this guy who's also Egyptian. He's also American. You guys are really kind of alike. He's a kick-ass music composer. Check his stuff out. And I did, and I was a fan, like, right away. And it's funny, because I feel like I've known you longer. I feel like we have are sort of blood brothers and soul brothers from a... Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's life. why we kind of clicked from from the beginning. It's, I, was like, I was like, oh, this this guy. I, I get this guy. This guy <laughs> and I would have been friends when we were kids, you know? Right, yeah. Um, and it feels like that. It feels like I've known you for 30 years or 40 years or something. Yeah, I feel like we... Not to date myself. <laughs> you look timeless. <laughs> I feel like we, I, in I feel your like kind we, i feel like we speak the same language and uh we got together and you know i was super just grateful to kind of have somebody though there's my sister amira diva <laughs> amira is going to be on the podcast next it's oh cool little, i might have her, i might have her swing in here really quick for a guest maybe in the end she literally walked in and like ah <laughs> you know you know my sister i do i just saw her so um, we met and, you know, I made this documentary in 2009 called Just Like Us. And I've talked about it on the podcast before. Uh, I took 10 American comics to Dubai, Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, performed in front of over 20,000 people. Whitney Cummings was in it and Sebastian Maniscalco was in it and uh, Maz Jabrani and uh, Eric Griffin and Kirk Fox and... The list goes on and on, and um, we shot 200 hours of footage, and we cut it into a 72-minute documentary, and we needed some music, so I met with Omar, and I gave him the film. Rough cuts we started with, if I remember correctly. Probably, yeah. I think so. And you were just such a fucking brilliant music composer as to how you were layering the vibe of the doc. Like, there was a, you know, music always can make or break a movie right and you just have such a great flow we disagreed on one song if i remember we did have one moment the, the one cue of infamy yeah you wanted more i won't no wait led zeppelin rambling on no we didn't disagree on rambling on man no, you're never gonna well, no, hear me. No. we not that we disagreed song. on the later one no there was a there was a well there were two of them actually now that i think about it there was a song that was in one of the countries that sounded too like put like put like Russian folk music. I, I remember that. And I was yeah. like, hey, can we switch that up? And you're like, yeah, no problem. I remember what the thing about Zeppelin was. I had totally forgot about this. I had forgotten about it. It was you had tempt the film with Ramble On, which it's fucking Zeppelin. Come on. Right. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. And I was like, man, don't use that as a temp because like what you're saying is this is a placeholder for something that you have to do that has to be as good, <laughs> if not better. And I'm like, well, don't tempt it with something that's by Led Zeppelin because I'm not going to beat that. It's an unrealistic You did, but you did in the end. You did. I don't know about that. I don't know. I tried. There's, I don't know there's if I a, did, but I, if I you tried. Watch, look, if you're watching this, go to YouTube, type in Cross Cultural Productions. You'll see the documentary. It's called Just Like Us. In the beginning of the film, as the journey starts, there is a feeling that I was going for as a director Yes, I direct two bitches. There's a feeling that I was going for. Where I was uh, like, hey, can you can you do something like this? Led Zeppelin rambling on. And you were, you know, I remember we were kind of not butting heads, but, you know, and then I, I don't know what happened. But we, we had like an aha moment. I came I came to your to your house and studio when you were living mm -hmm. in like Culver City or West L.A. or whatever. Yeah. yeah and yeah. we sat down. We sat down in your studio and I. You know, I was checking out his operation. He's like a fucking scientist. He has all these components <laughs> and musicians. And like, I look, I respect your your art and craft and what you guys do. It's from a from a technical level, it's just fascinating what you guys can do. But we ended up kind of agreeing. Oh, okay, this is the the feel of the music I'm going for, not copy a Led Zeppelin song. You know what I mean? No, no, of course. It was not. more like, can you yeah, go no, I... for this? kind of feel and you know what it works it actually to this day when i listen to that music you strung together i always like shed a little tear for some reason he knows that's why he did it you know you're trying to <laughs> tickle my cord are you hey man i'm glad it worked out i'm glad that's uh because that's a that's a tall order you know having that as a temp track it's uh, you know kind of informs as a composer it informs your decision of where you need to go and you know when it's something like that, I'm like, 
fuck, man. I mean, that's just a, that's a, that's a, it's a tall order. I don't know how else to put it. It's hard to, to deal, to compete with that, you know? And cause there is a, you know, it's, we don't want to, we're not going to knock off Led Zeppelin, but at the same time, it's like, it's hard to forget the temp. Like the biggest challenge for a composer is to have the director or producer, whoever's the creative, uh, head creative in it, you know, forget that there was music before your music, you know? Right. And when it's something like Led Zeppelin, you're like, man, that's, that's going to be rough, but we got through it. I got, you know, and now, like the last time I saw that film, I didn't even think about Ramble On. So in that sense, it's a success. Well, if you want to listen to the soundtrack, do you have any uh, music we can share with our listeners and watchers that we can sample from? Yeah, I don't know. Um, like that's from Just Like Us. I don't know what's going to, how well it's going to translate through the earbud, but we can try. Let's try. Um, and you know what? I have a, a story um, in a second because I was, I'll tell you in a second. It's a good story, though. <laughs> I mean, can you even hear that? Yeah. Turn, turn it up a little bit. Is this Tanks in the Streets? It is. The song's called Tanks in the Streets. In the movie, we go to Beirut, Lebanon, and there are literally tanks in the streets. And there's the big kind of explosion. It gets big. I remember that was this like song. A... This is one of my favorite songs of the movie. In the movie. Me too. There's a nice build-up crescendo. And when we're going through Beirut, Lebanon, you can kind of see... It's a really kind of militant type of music. Very, yeah. It works the picture. That I, I picked the wrong song, actually. The one I was thinking of. What about when you walk in? Uh, 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 oh, is that, yeah. is that it? This is this one, yeah. And then, so, the, and then the guitar solo. Oh, there's like the fun guitar, yeah. But yeah, no, but that's so when we when we go into Beirut, Lebanon, this song kicks in, and, and it kind of when you're watching the movie, you know, again going back to his, you know, as a music composer, you watch somebody sends you something with no music, right? And in your head, you're like, how do I lay in the right music per scene, per moment, per episode, right? Yeah, the music adds so For much sure. feeling too. Yeah. So like what yeah. What what's your I guess what's your process? What how do you get there? I mean or are you, you know, a lot are of you times... watching other movies and projects? Are you watching other stuff going, okay, I'm gonna take from that movie, I'm gonna steal from this. No, I mean, you know, project. I mean I guess when it, like I mean, I watch a lot of TV and films and stuff because you gotta know what else is going on out there and you see something that's like executed really well and you're like, Oh, that's cool. What did they do there? You back it, wind up, you know, uh, rewind. What do they do there? And you kind of, you know, you that's part of the the craft, you know, like being a composer for media is there's like the um, the intangible part, which is like the art, which is the you know writing music, but then that kind of commingles with the tangible, and the tangible is the craft of writing music to picture. And like, do you have the music play with the scene? Do you have it work against the scene? Is it better to not have music? Like, you know, there's all these different variables that go into, um, not to be punny, crafting a score. Um, <laughs> and so whenever, you know, generally at the beginning of the process and I'm sent like a rough cut or something, 90% of the times there's temp music, temporary music, right? And it's just whatever the editor or the music editor or whomever is choosing that uh, placeholder um, they put it in there just for timing. So they have something to cut the picture to, to establish, you know, pace and whatnot. Um, and then, so I'll watch it with that music and be, you know, kind of like, okay, I kind of get what they're going for. And then I'll turn it off and I'll never listen to the temp music again. Cause I don't want to rip it off. I don't want to knock it off, especially if there's something that like has cultural baggage, like, uh, ramble on or, you know, I've, I've had weird things, like things that are like big, massively culturally important uh, pieces of music. And, uh, you know, I just want to turn it off. I don't want to hear it. You know, my other my only other rule is I don't whenever I'm working on something, I don't listen to any other music that in any way or shape or form sounds like what I am have to work on. That's just like my my one thing. 
So if I'm working on uh, an orchestral score, I'm not going to listen to anything with orchestra just because I don't want to commingle everything, you know, and, you know, something kind of seeps in a little earworm seeps in your brain and then you, it ends up in your score, you know? So yeah, you want that, that kind of uh, helps me keeps it fresh. You want that clean, you want that clean canvas when you start, I guess, right? When you're scoring. Exactly. Exactly. Do, do you have yeah. like a bank or a library of stuff you've just, you know, that you could pull from and use? Yeah. You've actually, you, we licensed, I think we licensed some from you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there were, there were, and just like yeah. us, there was definitely some Couple licenses. Um, sometimes it's, sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on what the project needs. And, you know, if it's, um, like a narrative film, a lot of times that stuff has to be scored really either really tightly or whatever the, the palette that we're called on to use is, is very specific. And so I may not have anything remotely like that, you know, but I mean, there's times where like, I'll pull something from the archives and be like, Oh man, there's this scene I did for whatever project that for whatever reason didn't get used. There was a really good melody in there. I'm going to yank that from that track and use it in this track, you know? Yeah. So you'll, you'll mix and match from different tracks, but how many, if, how, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to ask you to coattail Blake's question about how many, uh, like how much music is in your library? Do you think original? No, I don't know. But thousands, thousands upon thousands. Right. Yeah. I have no clue. It's, it's, like, it's four or 5,000. I, I don't actually know. This you should, you should a... count. You should count one day. You should, <laughs> you should tally hours. up, tally tally up how much fucking music, music you have in there. Go to Spotify. You're going to get a yeah. random text from me one day. It's going to say 5,021. <laughs> You'll be like, what is that? I'm like, it's the answer to the Remember, question. I don't, right, I'll, right. Yeah, I'll look it up. I, I have no clue. Do you work or are you part of, you know, just selecting songs that you might like to use? Like on a, I was watching Forrest Gump recently and I was like, wow, just like the mm. music they put, you tell you, you definitely, when they go to Vietnam and, they use oh, those right. songs. Um, are you? A, no, that's you, not that's not me. That would be like the music supervisor. But do you work closely with them to know where they're going to put their songs? Yeah, I mean, generally, like you want to know what's going on, and um, you know, because you want the whole point in the score uh, is to you know make the film more cohesive. You know, mm -hmm. where it's like you know, because if you watch a film without the score, or without the sound design or without the VFX, like it feels like, you know, it's just some people in front of a camera acting like somebody that they're not, you know? And so like, and even if they're amazing actors, like it's still like it, it oh, through the editing process and all the various components, it kind of brings cohesion. And so you got to know what, you know, what they're trying to license for, like whatever important scene they want to put in whatever song, it's good to know. Um, and some, and especially like if there's like an overlap between, the score and the license piece, you know, they kind of got to jive. They got to work together. So, yeah, because I've heard them play um, in and it's out always of something each other. Keeping... Oh, sorry. Yeah, exactly. And so you you don't you don't want it to be unless that's the desire. You don't want it to be you know cacophony where mm -hmm. it's just kind of man, you know. Yeah, I realize in like horror movies how big. Uh, that's when I notice a lot of the scoring because it gets you all on the edge of your seat. Oh man, it's great. I so I just did. Um, uh, suspense and you know I watched it without um, and this is not uncommon so I'm working on this film at the same time that I'm working they're doing again the VFX and the sound design right and so and I'm watching it without the music because I haven't written the music yet and there's nothing scary about it you know yeah. as soon as you <laughs> add the score and the sound design that build it's up. like holy shit it gets super scary you know and it's like it's I mean, I have the utmost respect for like the sound designers and the mixers, all the different trades that work on a film. It's it's fascinating. It's fascinating. It still fascinates me to this day when a, a film comes together and, and ends up being good, much less great. You know, it's it's a very hard thing to do. And it's like you miss you fuck up one of those components mm -hmm. and it kind of ruins the film. You know, yeah. like the thing I always like to say is the score isn't going to make a shit film good. But the score if it sucks could make a good film shit you know and just the audience won't believe it or you'll you know tip the hat too much if there's you know you know anticipate too much what's going to happen it kind of ruins it for the audience there's all these things that could kind of happen along the way that'll fuck it up for everybody you know so it's uh it's 
still fascinating. It's magical to me how uh, movies and TV is made. Still hasn't that that hasn't gone away. Yeah. Let me ask you something. When you when you I guess stopped playing in bands, <clears throat> what hmm. was how and what was your transition into working as a music composer? That's a different muscle. That's a whole different side of the industry. Like, how did you get kissed into the deal, or did somebody find you, or? Did you start doing no, I sessions? mean, uh, so I, you know, I was in Austin and, um, you know, the writing was on the wall. I mean, the thing is, like, I was a big lover of film music from when I was a kid, which I got from my brother. My brother was like a big film score connoisseur. And so I got that from him. And then, um, you know, the band thing, I was like, eh, I don't want to be a broke musician. I don't want to, you know, be a touring musician. And it's, I don't see that as like the, the future. You sound like a car. Um, yeah, there's probably <laughs> I don't want to be. I'm sure. I don't want to be a broke touring comic. I don't want to be a broke. I don't want to be a broke. Comic. Yeah, that's all, that's all the arts, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, but cool. you know, well, music you say- look, being a being a music composer at your level is like a comic getting a TV series. Like now, you're doing real. I wouldn't say the live stuff isn't real work. It's it's a different payday. It's a different culture. It's a different environment. Exposure, everything. different exposure. Yeah, it's a totally different existence. That's for sure. I mean, so, you so know, how, it's. Uh, uh, how did it happen? Yeah. Um, like, what was your first gig, and how did you get? How did you get it? My first gig. Let me see. Uh, well, the first true gig. I so I had little snippets of music, like little thirty second uh, clips, that I burned to a CD, and I I was still in Austin, and I sent. I don't know how many of these I sent to every single music house, like the do like ads, jingles, stuff like that in LA. And nobody got back to me except for one person um, who, and, and she's now a very good friend of mine. So I know the true story or I know the, the actual story behind it. And it just happened that that CD was on her desk. And she said she would never listen to these things because they would get all these unsolicited uh, uh, demos. And for whatever reason, she was in a good mood and she popped it in and it happened to be mine. <laughs> Damn. And then she called me and said, hey, would you like to start doing commercials? And I was like, yes, I would. Oh, wow. And um, I didn't know that. And then, you know, I we had already been planning on moving to L.A. We moved, I think, you know, three, four, five, six months. I don't know, something later we were there. And I, you Who's know, we? wrote you on a bunch wife, of commercials. You and your wife. Me, me and Bethany, me and my wife. Yeah. You're, you're, you're married and, at, this, uh, at this point. I just married, like less than a year. And what was she like? Um, was she like, hey, uh, what are we doing in LA? Yeah, yeah, no, I like, think that, that's what, about what, right. What dream I mean, are you? You know, it was chase? a big event. We were super young, so it was like a you know a crazy adventure, you know. Yeah. And um, but at the same time, it was it's exactly what you're saying. It was very much chasing an adventure, and you know, when I look back upon it, I'm like, man, you know, had you known the odds or the probability of success, would you have embarked upon that journey? <laughs> maybe not i don't know you know what else is i gonna do so it's that but anyway I, I so i went i did that i did like some you know music for advertisement quickly realized i was not very good at it at all like it's not my thing uh i'm like as a musician i'm kind of a little left of center and like you know those the people i know that are very good at commercials they're right down the middle and they can <laughs> right. nail it really quickly right. for me it was a struggle anyways i did that and then i had just complete and utter dumb luck which is i found out um that somebody was looking to hire somebody who had a background in middle eastern music and orchestral music and like western you know contemporary music if you will and um and i was like hey that's me i can do that i studied all both of those or those schools of music for years and years. I know it like the back of my hand. And so I ended up getting this job and it was working for the drummer of the police, Stuart Copeland. And so that was really my first real job, I think. Um, and that, it, and it was, it was like, uh, you know, he's like the easily one of the most legendary drummers, you know, of, of modern times, you know, he's, and he's worshiped by the drum community. Um, by the way, and so a little fun fact, uh, his brother, Miles Copeland, used to manage the police and the Bengals I know that that's right and his and, and the other the brother pretenders. was the booking agent or was it the pretenders mm-hmm. yeah I met him because I was the go-go's the go-go's right sorry go ahead yeah yeah he and he yeah he released a bunch and his brother actually had a world music label that was big in um in the late 90s early 2000s that released like a bunch of those 
big world music albums and uh fascinating family but so i worked for him uh for i don't know two or three years i mean we're still really good friends but like working for him and he found was, like if i had to who? like i found him through found a, him? A, a well no somebody who worked for him had put a job posting online mm. and i saw it and i was like oh I'll apply for that. That's like totally up my alley. And then, you know, he sent it off and you think nothing of it, nothing's going to come of it because it's unlikely, but then something came of it. And I remember, uh, I think I got a call. Somebody called and said, Hey, can you come down to XYZ studio and whatever and meet? Um, and it, I didn't know who it was actually. They didn't say who it was working for. And I remember just going, ah! because it was a big moment for me. You know, it was like the first real thing, but working for him was amazing. Cause it was like, getting a master's degree in film scoring and just music in general. He's the guy's a wizard. So, um, I, yeah, if I had to like kind of pinpoint everything back to what got the ball officially rolling, it was that. And then from there, you just started kind of matrixing your way around the industry and and pretty much yeah, music and music realm of it. Right. And so well, uh, one thing leads to another, you know, I, so this is the story I was going to tell you earlier when we were playing that song. So I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, who I just did one of his films and um, something came up in conversation and I did this film for Disney that got canned. Like it, it was shot, edited, done in the can and it never got released for a number of reasons that are, have nothing to do with the film. The, I, know, I know what film you're talking about. The soccer movie. The United, the soccer movie. Yeah. So the funny thing is, so somehow we were talking about this and they're like, how did you get that, that film? And I was like, well, how did I get that film? I don't remember. Um, and then I was like, wait, no, I do remember. I had a film that I had scored called Just Like Us. And there was a piece <laughs> of music in Just Like Us at, uh, I don't, the, the, I'll tell you, sorry, I'll, I don't remember what, I'll, let me, you know let the me, song I'm talking because we just played it. Let me interject. Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, fuck, I'm blanking. Uh, what's his name? The director of the United? I mean, Mafalco. Amin, Amin Matalka, amazing director of Jordanian descent, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really talented uh, young director. And he saw our documentary, Just Like Us, at the Doha Tribeca Film Festival. That's correct. In 2010, he was sitting in the audience. I was sitting next to his, well, now, uh, his. it was his wife uh, who passed, God bless she, her. She's salt, passed, yeah. Claire, yeah. But we were all sitting together. And I remember he, I think he said, Who's who scored your movie? And I said, This really awesome guy named Omar Fadel, you should check him out. I think is that how it happened? I think that's how it happened. I think it's it's very I think Something the like story that, that I know is very similar, which is the producer of that film and I were good friends. And she was trying to get me to be the composer of the film. Right. And he wasn't gonna have it. Right. And then he was at that film festival. And I don't think he knew that I'd scored that film and that film. He watched the film and that scene came on, which I don't remember where that scene is that In has Lebanon. that piece of music. Lebanon. Is it Lebanon? Yep. And I remember like right afterwards, he called me, he said, Holy shit. What is this piece of music in there? We got to have you on the United. And I was like, okay, great. Lovely. Um, there's more to the story, but that's all I recall now. It's been a while. So, so basically I helped you get that gig. Hmm. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed, you did. I do want to uh, unknowingly. <laughs> unknowingly. That's the story of my life. <laughs> well, actually, but you were That's there me. with him, so maybe it was it was quite knowingly, actually. I think I think I probably put a bug in his ear and said, if you're gonna hire a music guy, this is your guy. Well, um, I appreciate it. I don't, uh, it's uh, no, uh, it's nothing. <laughs> um, you have but really proposed... to, to be honest what we really should be doing is thanking Iyad because Iyad introduced us Iyad is the everything he's, everything he, goes he's the originator Iyad. yes yeah all roads lead through Iyad you have composed 40 plus projects is that right yeah that's what it says on IMDB oh, I do okay. want I do I do want to carve out one project it's a film mm -hmm. that uh, he composed the music on called day one which was nominated for an Oscar. Mm. So tell us about, it, it didn't win the Oscar, it got nominated. No, it didn't win. But, um, but you're still part of a Oscar nominated movie that you scored the music for. So tell me, tell us a little bit about that movie. It was a very 
if I remember, kind of a racy topic. Well, it was about a, a translator in the U.S. Army's first day on the job and like all this shit that unfolds during that day. And um, this is a good story because it's one of the, it, you know, the thing I've learned over the years um, is that you never know what's going to happen with something like you work on something. And then, you know, in between when I work on something and when it's released and when, uh, you know, it, critical acclaim like there's long gaps of time as you know right and that's one of those films like i worked on it i was happy with the score i thought it was cool by the way a little bit of little tidbit here so we can get rid of the woodwinds and the brass uh uh conversation <laughs> just I'm, I'm gonna throw this out here that entire score is all woodwinds there's no other instruments in it <laughs> so you scored it but you didn't play the instruments yeah i mean i i there's i do stuff all the time that i don't play literally don't play it you know just because I, I don't play the instrument or i don't play the instrument well i mean you that's, know that's like me there's like a... instruments that i play like i play the piano i think i play it pretty well but there's things that i've written that i cannot play uh like they're too fast or too technical or whatever and somebody else will do it but that sounds day like one, me as a, as a comedian and a producer like i think i'm a pretty good comic i could play the piano kind of but i'd, I'd rather produce and like compose i'm, I'm, a, I'm a comedy composer I'm like there the Quincy Jones. Well, you got like to know, you know, you know your limitations too. Yeah, I don't. I, look, you. I'm not going to sell out arenas. It, it's it's too late. I, I would have done it. <laughs> I'm 51. It's over. Right? Just do the fucking Hollywood Tales podcast and just come here every week. And this is your, your <laughs> like it's over. Unless I bank a big blockbuster movie or get on a hot sitcom, I'm not going to sell out. This arenas. is called a midlife crisis, right? This here. is for sure called a midlife crisis. No, but just a, <laughs> se seriously. It's okay. We, Mine's on the horizon too. So I'll, I'm, I'll be right. <laughs> give me a couple of years. I'll be there with you. No, but you, so, so you score this, this movie it gets uh, nominated for an Oscar. Uh, well, so the story, this is what I was saying is that, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And it, it's happened to me time and time again, that you do something and it ends up going places you never thought it was going to go. Like that film, I, I finished it. I liked the score. Um, they couldn't get, or they didn't, or they, whatever, they couldn't get like a big uh, uh, film festival premiere. So it premiered at some small festival. And then, you know, you forget about it because you kind of move on to your next thing. You know, that's like, that's the composer life. It's like, it's nice in the sense that you can work on something for a small period of time and then you go to the next one. And so, you know, you just kind of forgot about it or I, I forgot, you know, Okay, you know, maybe it didn't work out with that film. And then over the course of four, five, six months, it just kept winning all these awards. And I would get these random emails being like, day one, one, whatever. I don't even remember. One, I think it won a BAFTA. Um, it won all this stuff. And I was just thinking like, what the fuck? Okay, cool. And then one day, they, you know, watching like the Oscar, uh, I guess the short list. And it was like, it was on the short list. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. And then, I don't know, a couple months later, they released the nominations and it's nominated for a fucking Oscar. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, too. I mean, it's and that's happened several times where, like, you just don't know what's going to happen. So back to the uh, the uh, the arena comedy uh, part of the company. You just don't know. <laughs> did yeah, it, did, it uh, the did that help your career being? Well, because you, you're you, OK, so your music didn't get nominated, but it will very soon, inshallah. Inshallah. I, I, I mean, you, it was certainly. I know you're, you're going to get nominated and I know you're going to win an Oscar. But to be part man. of a nominated Oscar film, did that get you some street cred around town? I'm sure it got you some some meetings. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely opened. a good bullet point on yeah. um, on the resume. You know, we got a better agent as a result of it. And then, you know, I've had a couple things that um, projects like that that you didn't necessarily think are going to get any steam, not in a bad way, just because you, know, you don't know what's going to happen. And um, I had a project last year, a uh, documentary called Belly of the Beast that won an Emmy. So that helped. And then I've had things that like Peabody's and BAFTAs and, and they add up and they're good bullet points on the resume, you know? Um, and really all they do is they make it so you appear more legitimate and you can charge a higher amount. So yeah, it's just well, a good it, al it also gets you in the door. Right? Isn't that the whole idea? Yes, like hey, for you sure. get you for get sure. the meet, yeah. you get the meeting and then it's up to you to, to, to close the deal. But saying you have these feathers in your cap 
certainly help. Hey guys, yeah, go it's never check a bad a, thing. Yeah, it's never a bad thing. If you're on Instagram, go to Omar underscore Fadel underscore composer. Omar O M A R underscore F A D E L underscore composer. That's his Instagram. Check him out on his uh, website, Omar Fadel dot com. O M A R F A D E L dot com. Um, what's your best Hollywood tale? Man, you know, I have given oh, a lot oh, of thought well, to this. Uh, sorry, sorry, before you say that, what's oh, coming up What's coming up next for you? And then end it with your best Hollywood tale, sorry. Uh, ooh, I, like I'm projects not, wise. Do you the have problem, stuff? I'm not allowed to say. You're not allowed to I'm talk. Just, like, everything, you know, you're the third I'm guest. On, I sign an NDA on everything. <laughs> you're literally the Perfect. third guest today that because we, we're, we're making podcasts like, <clears throat> you know, all day today. And literally, literally three guests were like, oh, I, I can't talk about that. I said, I, I respect it. It's fine. We'll wait. Yeah, it's not. It, I wish I could, man. It's like one of these things, like where like the first thing that they make me do is sign an NDA, and I'm just like, Zip. I get. I it. can't do it. Okay. We can talk off air. But, but <laughs> check out Omar on Instagram, on social media, and his website. And uh, let's just let's just wrap it up. We like to keep these podcasts like under 50 minutes, you know. But if you have a Hollywood tale that might go a little longer. Uh, Funniest, Man, you know, was, most most dramatic, darkest, weirdest, whatever your best, and it doesn't have to have happened in Hollywood. It could have happened anywhere around the world. Sure, it has to be sure, Hollywood sure. Too. I mean, you know, I was thinking about this last night, and I'm not like, um, I don't dwell on the past, and I my short term memory is kind of, or long term memory is kind of shit. So I was like, well, what is my best Hollywood tale? And I couldn't think of any. I mean, I I think of like strange things that have happened to me over the years that are just a byproduct of being you know in la like i i was thinking about the other day um for, i don't know how this happened it's a very strange thing it's not on my imdb i don't think it is but i it, this was like a year after i moved to la for some fucking reason i was a background musician in this movie called charlie wilson's war do you know this yeah with uh was that tom hanks tom yeah. hanks and yeah. so, like, if there's like a couple seconds where there's like some dude in the background playing, that's me. <laughs> I, and I don't know how. I singing can't even remember or, like how. Did you say background? No, no. Singing? It's like there was like pre-recorded music, oh, and I was okay, just okay. you know, right. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Karaokeing it, I guess. Not karaokeing, you know, lip syncing, but with an instrument. But uh, <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was like, I don't know how that even happened. Like, how did somebody find me for that to be the case? But like, as far as weird stories, like we had just moved from Texas. Like I didn't know anything. And all of a sudden I'm on this film set and then I'm in the bathroom peeing at the urinal and I, you know, you know look up and there's Tom Hanks peeing in the urinal next to me. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck, you know, and we were both dressed up in the, the, the costume. So I think I had like a big mustache. I look like a, a punch of or something. He's like a real big, thick mustache. And like some gaudy uh, outfit, and he was dressed in some seventies like, I think tight fitting suit. It was a very <laughs> peculiar moment, right. you know. Um, <laughs> and there's just been weird stuff like that that's happened over the years. I remember at the Just Like Us premiere in New York, and there I am talking to De Niro. I'm right. like, what the fuck is going on? Like right. it's very peculiar. Um, Do you have a picture? Yeah, of that, I don't... Of, that, of of uh, of you and Charlie Wilson's war. A picture of you in the urinal. Not in the urinal, but in, in, in the urinal. <laughs> when I'm looking up, preferably. Uh, you might have. A, I'll send it to you. I'll have you to look send for me, it. Send it, me some assets because we're gonna, as the podcast, <clears throat> when the podcast airs. Well, hold on a second. Our, for our the banner are, of the podcast, are you gonna put that picture of me with the big mustache? No, that's not, the question. Not, not in the banner, but during the conversation, we might blast it up if we can find and it. And this is what Omar looks like today. <laughs> yeah. Big mustache. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll find it. I have to, I'll dig around. Um, that's a classic though. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like other big stories. I mean, I don't, I don't think I have like one end all be all story, but any, um, any like big, like fancy music composers, like Hans Zimmer, or like, have you crossed paths with these guys who I've crossed paths with some of those guys. I've been to their studios and stuff. It's super cool. I don't know if those are great stories. I mean, my, um, you know, after working for Stuart, um, you know, I made friends with all of these guys that are like big rock stars because those are the, you know, his peers, you know, even though he's a very established film composer and now he composes operas, 
you know, in the hanging around were all these musicians. So like all of the musicians um, who all worship him, especially the drum community, I've hung out with all of them, the, the Foo Fighters and the U2s and the... Mm. Um, we, the just had, we just had the Foo Fighters... Down. We just had the Foo Fighters movie director on here earlier, B.J. Oh, McDonald. Yep. Yeah, he I can't whole, wait to see that film. Yeah, it looks it looks pretty good. Studio Six Six Six. But sorry, go yep, ahead. Yep, yep, it's, it's on my list. No, but I mean, I remember. Uh, I don't even know how old I was. It was me and Stuart and Serge Tankian from System of a yep. Down, and was... we're all sitting there playing and wow. recording, and that's on YouTube somewhere, I'm sure. Um, there's just been weird stuff like that that you just never imagined happening, and uh, you know, and the older you get, it becomes like something that's happened and your brain kind of, it's kind of fuzzy. And it's like, I don't remember, you know, there were always, uh, always good times. I can say that. <laughs> well, Omar, my brother, it's been an honor and a pleasure. We really appreciate you making time. You are one of the most talented music musicians, music composers out there. Um, check them out on Instagram, Omar underscore Fadel underscore composer. His website's omarfadel.com. Love you, brother. Man, for, thank you guys for having me, man. It was a blast. Thanks and, for, uh, we have some good fun. laughs. And air hugs. Time. Air hugs. Habibi? Oh, yeah, Habibi. We got some Habibis going. <laughs> Habibi, air hugs. There you go. Here, one more Habibi. <laughs> Give me a... <clears throat> awesome, man. Well, we're going to sign out, and we're going to close out, awesome. and then come back on and, like, come back and do another episode if you have stuff you want to plug or talk about. Man, I would love to do it. Thank you guys for having me, man. I had a blast. Hell yeah. Thanks, man. That was too, brother. Have a great day. Right, say hi to, say right, hi man, to Beth and Serge. You got it. I will. His son's name is Serge. <laughs> All right. That was fun, right? Yep. Super fun. This guy's so talented, man. He's like literally one of the most brilliant musicians I've ever met. And I've never seen him in a bad mood. I've Seems never like seen him like cranky. Yeah, he's like a nice guy, real positive. Go to omarfaddle.com. Check him out. Yep. Can we get rid of these heads, headphones? That's been another great, awesome episode of Hollywood Tales uh, with my co-host, Blake Barty. Yeah. My name is Ahmed Ahmed. Go to Ahmed Ahmed Comedy on Instagram. At Blake Barty Comedy. Check out Jam in the Van on Instagram. Go to their website, jaminthevan.com. There's always awesome shows happening here. Tons of content. Tons of content. They have music, comedy, recording studio, cooking. It's 420 friendly. Uh, big shout out to, to Jake and Dave who own the place. Jake Trainer, uh, the venue manager, Jack, <coughs> excuse me, Jack Higgins, our creative director, and the one and only Wolf Ramirez. And Alex, you you sat in and helped out a little bit. Killed it. I don't I never even got your last name, Alex. Uh, Jack. Alex Jack? Yeah. First name's Jack. Jack Alex? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jack Alex. <laughs> or maybe you just you fucked his name up. So that's cool. Did I? I thought it was I thought it was Alex for some reason. Uh, Fuck. Yeah.